on today's episode of Locked on Suns. The single biggest change we have seen since the All-Star break is Bradley Beal looking like a whole new man. How did he do this? Can it hold? And much more. Let's go. You are Locked on Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And we're back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brendan Clean. I'm a writer over at Dime Magazine, the host of the Just Basketball Show. I also create video and written content for the Locked On Suns Insiders community, which you can sign up at the link in the show description below. Thank you for joining us wherever you are finding us. We are free and available everywhere, including YouTube. If you're finding us for the first time, just hit that follow or subscribe button. Maybe if you just haven't done it before, but you listen all the time, that's a great way to support the show and make sure you get a new episode in your feed every single day. Become an everydayer. Get locked onto the Suns all season long. Today's show is brought to you by Prize Picks, the best place to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use the code Locked on NBA when you make your first deposit to get it matched up to $100. That's pricepicks.com, promo code locked on NBA. We'll talk about them coming up. But first, joining us as he does every single week here on Monday is Brandon Duenas. He is a writer over at Bright Side of the Sun. And we have a lot to get to. So, Brandon, I just want to throw this simple question your way Is Bradley Beal a new man? I think so. I think uh, just based off everything he's saying and he's backing up his talk as far as his, his mindset shift, that that quote was awesome to hear that he just kind of said, somebody's got to do it. And he took it upon himself to go out there and, and play defense at, at a higher level. And yeah, I think I think we're looking at the, the new and improved Bradley Beal that's uh, sacrificing. So love to see it. Yeah, it's obvious just from the matchups he's getting right. I mean, this week alone, he's guarded DeJounte Murray, Tyrese Maxey. There's been games in the... He even got Damian Lillard in the second half after things were already a little hairy, but did a, a better job, I think you would say, than Grayson Allen did or anyone else probably would have from a defensive standpoint in that game, which we talked about the last time you and I recorded. I would say, I mean, playmaking-wise, right, too, yep. he is... I think it was 12 to just one turnover in the Spurs game on Saturday night, the night before we're recording. And uh, it just feels like a, a very different version of the guy we have been seeing. I think the the obvious other ingredient you have to pinpoint, though, Brandon, is he's healthy. And it kind of yeah. sucks almost in a way to... I, I, I don't want to make it a negative. It just it, it makes you feel like, wow, we could have been seeing this all along if these guys had maybe just... Like this evolution could have started in December if everybody just played more games. It, it, it is kind of a bummer in that way. Yeah, and that's why after that Bucks game, even though they lost, the the way and I said this, just the way he was moving in that game was really encouraging, and I think a sign of things to come. And the health is key with him and with this entire team. Just seeing them finally get these reps healthy, and it helps that they're playing against the Embiid list Sixers and the, the Trey Young list Hawks and the NBA talentless Spurs, like it's, it's, it, that definitely helps. But at the same time, these are the games that in the past we'd see this team kind of snooze for. And so we can't have it both ways. So I'm not going to take these wins for granted. They need them desperately. They need these minutes and reps desperately, and they should have had them uh, a lot earlier, but you'll, you'll take it. And I think Beal's health, obviously, and just the playmaking, like you said, I think it's like 49 to 19 assisted turnover ratios last six games. Like he's, mm. He's just been more involved in the early initiation of the offense to take some of that pressure and workload off book and Durant on that end, and then also on the defensive end, stepping up. So I think that combination frees both those guys up and allows them to be who they are. And just like I said, just the sacrifice is something they're going to need, not just from Beal, but from Book and Durant too on, on some nights. Or they're going to need to just you know swallow their pride and, and just do whatever task is at hand to, to win games. So... Definitely encouraging. Good to see Beal healthy. Yeah. yeah, two, three straight wins 
in double digits. So I agree completely. It, it would have been a very different conversation, I think, coming off of these three wins if it felt tight. And not to say those the Sixers and the Hawks games were like a breeze, but it was basically a couple ugly first quarters and then they handled business the rest of the way. The Spurs, they just led wire to wire, which is exactly what you want to see. And finally, a night where guys get to rest a bit and something I think we all would have liked to have seen from this group more consistently and not having, you know, 40 minutes played against like the Raptors and, and things like that. But it, it is what it is. A couple other numbers on Beal. Pre-All-Star versus post-All-Star, you know, you can get infinitely you know, microscopic with some of these numbers if you really want to. But just as a general contrast, I think this is pretty good. 10 more touches per game post-All-Star break versus pre-All-Star break. And we're at about a month now since the break. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, hand, it's a solid handful of games. And a, almost a minute and a half more time of possession per game post-All-Star break compared to pre-All-Star break. So... The split has been fairly balanced all year. Book leads the way. Durant has been second. Beal is in third. And that's the same even with this evolution since the All-Star break. But it's gotten a little closer. And as we know with Durant, he can touch it a lot, but not ever feel like he's dominating the ball. So his time of possession is, is actually behind Beal. And I think this feels a lot more like put the ball in your guard's hands, let them go to work. Work the work whatever mismatch you want. It has felt a little bit more like closer to 50-50 between Booker and Beal, but I think they're also doing a good job on the offensive end, Brandon, of even when Beal is like running a set, so to speak, I think it's a lot more dialed back. Not to say he's a bad passer or that he can't read the game or whatever, but it's not he's not Chris Paul out there and I think he's not even Devin Booker. But it's like he can dribble, he can make the right read, he can make and execute a, a simple pass and he has the gravity that's going to demand that he's guarded and all those things. So let's run something off ball, spring somebody open and, and have Beal deliver that pass and he's been doing that pretty well. Honestly, the thing that all of this makes me wonder though is Aside from health, and this includes the defensive end, which if you think back to that Pelicans game, I felt like we were turning a corner when he guarded Zion and I was getting very excited about like, wow, he can be this on-ball defender that this team really needs and that's kind of what we had all been waiting for and then it, it, it disappeared for a while. Why do you think this did not happen sooner besides the fact that there haven't been reps? Because pretty much since Christmas or just after, these guys have mostly been healthy. Why did it take so long for them to click Beal's role into place when I think if you had asked us in July, we probably would have told you Beal's role should look something like this. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, if it's the first time you're doing something as a basketball player and playing an entirely different role and trying to embrace that while also working back from uh, multiple injuries, getting hit in the face, dealing with a lot of very uh, – it was just a roller coaster season all around. So I think just trying to finally settle into that and fully embrace it takes a, a mindset for it to become consistent. Because like you said, we saw flashes of it. We're like, is this here to stay? And it, I think Beal's finally fully embracing it. He's fully healthy and that makes it easier. And then also on the flip side, uh, Durant and Booker are, are taking advantage of it. And, and I feel like welcoming him and, for, for any new team with this much turnover, there's going to be those growing pains. Like I still don't think they're out of the woods yet. There's still a lot of things they need to correct. And I think it's uh, easy for them to look like a well-oiled machine against the Spurs, but it's uh, something I'm not going to sneeze no. at at this point. <laughs> they so, are not uh, over, over the hump by any means, exactly. but I think this is an important ingredient. A hundred percent. So I think the fact that he's fully embracing it and his quotes are lining up with his actions. That's what I think with those two things being aligned and, and then winning games, that also helps. Because if he's doing all this sacrificing and, and they're they're losing and he's not getting touches or, you know, whatever, whatever you want to say. Like, I think that's a lot like more difficult to embrace. Uh, but winning cures everything. So I think if they can just keep stacking the wins and I don't think they're going to care too much about counting stats. And, and that goes for Booker and Durant too. Like, I think there's been games where Durant sacrificed a lot offensively and 
whenever they've lost, he's not been, he's vocally been a little frustrated about it at times and, and rightfully so. So I think uh, whenever he they've won though, I don't think that you hear a peep from him or book about their touches or shots or anything like that. So just keep stacking the wins. Uh, it makes embracing different roles a lot more easy, like easier for, for everyone. So, yeah. Yeah. I, the thing, I guess I want to, I hope to hear from him and, you know, maybe if it hasn't been, asked and they come back home i'll ask him but the the question in my mind is how does he feel that outside of defense which i think makes more sense it's a little more like what he was doing when he was playing next to john wall like 10 years ago on defense so that that is a change but offensively like you look at the numbers or the way he was playing and part of why I thought he would be such a hand-in-glove fit on the offensive end with this team, even without a traditional point guard, was he had a 30% assist rate last year. Um, or two years ago, it was 30. Last year, it was 27. So, and, and the COVID year when he averaged 31 a game, or 31 and then 32, whatever, he was up there in assist rate as well. So he is a guy that has been able to use his scoring ability to open up opportunities for teammates and deliver the pass to them consistently and 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 get assists like that's never really been an issue even next to russell westbrook or again kuzma and porzingis who have the ball quite a bit and everything else how does he feel like this is actually a different approach on offense even than that i guess would be my question it's better players i think you would have to say maybe that's just the simple answer is I'm going to look for mine more if I'm playing next to, you know, a decent starter like Kuzma rather than a Hall of Famer like Kevin Durant. That might be it. But I want to, as he does it more, I'm curious, like really at a granular level, like what is he doing differently? What does he feel like he's had to adjust? And we'll continue to see it play out. Another evolution we have seen over the past week or so by the Suns is the bench being a strength. And again, as Brandon said multiple times, that has been a lot easier to say and do uh, against bad teams, but that is how you get blowout wins is your bench actually performs rather than having to put your starters in to save the day in every single fourth quarter. So let's look at then versus now, the beginning of the year versus now and why the bench feels a little more trustworthy than it has coming up next. You are locked on Suns. First, today's show brought to you by Robinhood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can also still have an IRA? Well, Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirements accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on that 3% match. And Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with that 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. So get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024, validated by Radius. Global market research investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match includes, requires Robinhood gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% match on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. Today's show also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Keeping it rolling, Brandon. So first, I want to remind everybody to check out the Locked on Suns Insider subscriber community where you can support the show. You can get my written and video analysis of games and trends and observations, as well as every 
news, piece of news or rumor that comes out about the sun sent directly to your phone. You can reply to me. You can do Q and A's and mailbag stuff. As we grow that base of people, go to joinsubtext.com to sign up or visit the link in the show description below. The bench, Brandon. We saw another game with three guys in double figures in the main four bench players the Suns have settled on, which has pretty much been, uh, well, the past two games for sure. And it feels like it's been building toward this, settling into who's playing as well as getting some production and consistency out of those guys. What have your thoughts been on on this nine-man unit the, the Suns have kind of decided on? And why do you think it's working better now than maybe at any point in the season? Well, the first and obvious thing is just the, the big three is all healthy. And that, that makes everyone's role a lot more clearly, clearly defined. It, it makes them uh, more susceptible to getting open shots. And I think the spacing is, is a lot better. So uh, a guy like Eric Gordon, for example, I think he... Anytime he makes like two or three threes in a game, you could pretty much chalk it up as a Suns win. I'll, I'll do a deep dive on that and kind of look into some, some numbers and see if I could pull a stat. But uh, I think a lot of these guys. The are thing built with to that play. that's tough is a lot of the he's had to play. He's had to start or play like really heavy minutes so often that some of those numbers, it's like, well, yeah, he produced better because he was playing a lot. So that, but yeah, the thing true. with him that's been nice this week is to see him produce in an actual bench role and keep the exactly. rhythm, even though he's just having to kind of come in cold and be a real bench player. For sure. And th those threes just feel like daggers when you have like Booker and Durant, like rolling offensively, you have Beal, you know, penetrating, getting wherever he wants. And then all of a sudden, you know, Gordon's wide open in the corner, the top of the key for a three. It just, it feels like it just wears the defense out. So I think he's one of those pivotal pieces that if he's hitting shots with the big three doing what they do, it's just, it feels overwhelming defensively. It's same with, uh, with Grayson, but uh, I think Royce O'Neal's shooting as well has been, uh, you know, those, those first two home games against uh, Atlanta and Philly, th th he was, he was on one. So I think th this just comes down to spacing really. And then obviously like, you know, you're talking about Robin Hood earlier, the ad, if, if I could invest all my stock, it would be into to bull bull right now. And I, I think we, we need to see more minutes. I, I've been preaching it all year. We need more. Uh, he, he had some pretty unreal shots yesterday, and he's playing confident. So uh, he, I think he's another key piece that it, obviously he's still pretty young. You can't, you don't know what you're going to get some nights, but I think just giving him, instilling that confidence in him and, and letting him do his thing um, alongside those, uh, like I said, just the, the big three. I think him and, him and Gordon are two guys that if they're rolling and, and the, the big three are rolling, like good luck. Because this team is is a problem. So th th those are the main pieces that I think just are starting to settle in a little bit. And and Eubanks has even had some good run lately. So got to give him credit there. I know uh, some people aren't the biggest fans of him, but I, I think, you know, you got to give him props when, when he's playing hard. And you know, they, they, they could use as many positive minutes as possible. So we'll take it. Yeah. <clears throat> With Eubanks, just to key in on that real quick, I – the ask of him is pretty limited, right? So I think that's part of why Vogel has stuck with him. The small ball stuff is, I think I was pushing it for a while before the Suns finally started to use it, but now I'm kind of on the side of pump the brakes a little bit. It's not going to be, the Suns aren't going to ride that for, you know, let's say Nurkic plays 30 minutes in the playoffs. The Suns can't do that for the other 20 minutes. It's going to be in in bits and pieces. We've already seen the limitations of Durant can get tired. It's unreasonable to ask a guy who's 20, who's 35 years old to be your top scorer as well as, you know, defending a center for 20 minutes a game. So maybe they do that for five minutes a game. And yeah. Nurkic plays 30. And now you're really only needing 10 to 15 good minutes out of Eubanks and I think the other reason that the progression has come for him and that Vogel has stuck with him is truly, I believe the, the, the mistakes that Eubanks makes are mental. He, he just does not seem to be a guy who instinctively reads where he needs to be on defense and can process coverages as elite, I mean, better than I ever would, better than anyone we're watching in March Madness, right? He's a, he's an NBA player, but 
compared to some guys in the league, those lapses are going to be there. So it's about it's about limiting those. Like even on yeah. Thursday when he played really well and Nurkic had foul trouble, <laughs> KD was about to, you know, I, I'm, I'm saying this as a joke, was about to like smack the dude in the face on one of the defensive possessions. I'm sure people saw it on the broadcast. It was very clear in the arena. He was like exaggeratedly like, what the hell? I think he's a frustrating person to play with the same way he's a frustrating person to watch, but it's 10 to 15 minutes. Can you get him to plug yeah. in and 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 focus for 10 to 15 minutes? And I think they've been getting it. The point I wanted to make though, and I'll pass it back to you is mm. how much this has changed since the beginning of the season and not even the beginning of the season, but if you think back, right? December 13th is the first game that the big three played together when the twins came back to town. Uh, the bench, the rotation that night, even. Bol Bol got zero minutes. Eubanks got four. The Metu started at the four. So Grayson Allen and Eric Gordon were both out. It's not the perfect example. Let's just say Grayson would have started. Let's say Yudawat Nabe, who got seven minutes, probably would have been out of the rotation. Okogi was also out. But still, Metu plays 20 minutes. Little plays 27, Goodwin plays 27, Bates Diop plays 12. That was the rotation around the big three. So I think the other thing to say is like O'Neal coming in and the big three being healthy, yes, but even just the whole rest of the ro rotation being healthy, we're talking about a pretty small sample of Vogel actually settling in on what he wanted his guys to be and starting to pick and choose what the combo... Like, we, the Suns don't play an all-bench lineup. They don't even play five bench guys. So what matchups and combos does he like? And I think that's gone a long way, too, of just getting... Same as we're talking about with the big three. The other guys need it, too. Just reps and comfort. Yeah, and I have a couple of things on you, Banks. I think number one is... And this is more offensively, just in terms of putting him in a position to succeed. This is something I think... And Eddie Johnson actually talks about this a lot, is like... Some of the passes they're giving him are just not in putting him in a favorable favorable position. So it's like knowing your personnel. I feel like that happens. He's like they're so used to Nurkic being that secondary hub for the offense, where they can, you know, run the essentially run the the secondary offense through him. And Eubanks is definitely yeah. not that. So I think understanding what he is and embracing that for short stretches, that's how you're going to maximize him. He needs to be same with the Kobe. Both those guys need to come in five minute stretches each half give him 10 minutes, like let's say five or like five to six minutes at a time and just say, go as hard as you can, wear the other team out, make sure they're, you know, they're not having a fun time playing against you when you're on the court. Like give me everything you have for two short stretches. And that is your role. If, if a Kogi and Eubanks can be that, I think come playoff time, that's the maximized version of, of them that can provide energy, kind of wake the team up in a sense and just, you know, play that physical defense where, if you're burning fouls between those two, like it, it doesn't matter. Like they're there for a very specific reason for 10 to 12 minutes stretch, like throughout the game and just kind of burn through those, those fouls, like I said, and yeah. just embrace that role. To me, that's the, the role of chaos and, and just giving it your all for the, those stretches is what they should be doing. So I think, uh, you know, Kogi just came back. So obviously it's, it's a little bit different. They're going to try to probably ease him in a little bit here, but um, I still think, uh, whether you like him or not, Eubanks is going to play a factor in the playoffs and they're going to need him to, especially with Nurkic's foul trouble and, and all that. So uh, they're yeah. they're going to need to figure out how to maximize him as much as they can without playing him too much, essentially. So it's, it's kind of a, a fine line they have to balance. Yeah, I think the questions I have going forward are, does Kogi break in and make this a 10-man rotation or or does he kind of look more like a specialist. And I think that's directly connected to how much Beal can continue to be impactful as a, as a on-ball defender. And who and they then, match up with too, also. That, for that sure, come postseason time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I think O'Neal and Gordon, their minutes will fluctuate and they'll just take each other's minutes based on who has it going on offense because they both have shown themselves to be pretty streaky. So I think those are the two things to watch going forward. But let's look a little bit forward. The rest of this road trip and a little bit into the playoffs with really only a few weeks to go and very much time to start thinking about who the Suns might play. We'll get into all that next. First, today's show brought to you by Prize Picks. It's demon time. 
at Prize Picks, and you can now win up to 100 times your money with as few as four correct picks, turning $10 into 1000 Demons and goblins are the newest and most exciting way to play at Prize Picks. Squares marked with red demons or green goblins get you different payouts. You can now win up to 100 times your money with as few as four correct picks. What I love about Prize Picks all the time is that it is very simple. No pool, no head to head, no league. It is simply you versus the Prize Picks player projections. In addition, quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Check them out. At prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use the code locked on NBA when you make your first deposit to get it matched up to $100. That's prizepicks.com promo code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Closing out the show. All right. So the rest of this road trip. Brandon is going to be much more difficult. We have this Spurs game to see on on Monday, but not expecting that to be too crazy. You know, I, I guess if the one thing would be if Victor Wimanyama is able to have a little bit more of an impact, maybe if the game's closer, he can play a little more. But the Spurs look pretty pathetic on Saturday. I, I think the Suns should be able to handle them. Beyond that, Denver, Oklahoma City, New Orleans. Which one excites you the most? That is that is a murderer's row, but also three games that I think Suns fans should be excited for. These are the tests that you need heading into the postseason. Yeah, I think just rewinding to the Spurs, it's tough. Even it, they are the Spurs, I, I understand. It's tough in the NBA to beat the same team on consecutive nights. Uh, it doesn't matter who you're playing. So I think especially with the weird – can we just talk about real quick how they had the, the double home stand and how the double away stand against them? Like, it's just, I, I don't like that. Like, a weird Silver schedule be, for be sure. Now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, looking ahead, like ahead to these next few matchups, I think the the Oklahoma City Thunder, like the Denver one's obvious one that I think a lot of people are going to pick, but I think OKC is the, the one that I'm looking forward to the most because that's a potential matchup in the playoffs for them. And I think that's uh, in the first round, it, it, it could happen. You never know. But yeah. Um, to me, they're the team that I think presents the most unique matchups just for, for from both teams. Like the, the OKC really struggles to rebound. Um, that's something the Suns, I think, could take advantage of against them. But at the same time, staying in front of Shea is going to be almost impossible for the Suns team. So there, there's some really like unique battles within the battle so that I, I would look forward to in that matchup. The Denver one's obviously going to be uh, interesting, just, you know, both those being on the road and then the Pelicans are, you know, a game and a half in front of Phoenix right now. So they're, they're fighting to, to stay out of the play in too. So I think just with how loaded the West is right now, just everyone essentially trying to get out of the play in, like that, that's going to be a big one. So um, all three are massive, but first you got to take care of business yeah. against the Spurs and uh, just hope you can come out of that little three game stretch still in the six seed at least. Yeah. I think I would have to agree. The Thunder game just being the how, how much the Thunder have dominated them. I may sneeze, mm-hmm. but I'm going to power through. Um, to me, the Thunder thing, like it's easy to focus on Shea, but I agree with you. Nobody can really guard, guard him. You have to have a point of attack defender who can make him work. It's kind of like Luka, but more dynamic, I guess. And then really it's your team defense that has to hold up. Can you rotate? Can you help? Can you take away the rim on the drives and not allow him to get comfortable, have some hands and some limbs and some bodies in his way as he's driving to the basket, as he's working in isolation, and then be ready when he sprays it out to contest, recover, rotate, and basically the the goal should be never allow them to get any easy shots. The point is, Shea's going to make hard shots. Their three-point shooters can make contested threes, whatever. But I want to see that game be a real test of the Suns' collective team defense. And then if if they can have a huge offensive night, I think they, you know, they can beat the Thunder. That's not some sort of, like, kryptonite. But they give them trouble, for sure. And Jaylen it would Williams be a, tough, a big too. emotional... It would be, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's they don't harder. have... The problem is they don't even have the guy necessarily to make it hard unless a Kogi is able to be out there for long periods of time, which is not usually the case because of his offense. 
So maybe it just is the case like they don't have even that and it kind of falls apart from there. But I believe they can beat them. So it would be a big emotional uh, lift to prove to yourself, I think, if you're in that son's locker room that like, hey, this these young guns aren't just like, you know, going to kill us forever. But all right. So agreed. And Ingram's out probably in that Pelicans game. So that mm-hmm. that helps. But let's look at the playoffs. A little bit because these teams are obviously and not just this rest of this road trip but the rest of the schedule period is going to be one playoff potential playoff preview after the next because the standings are so in flux and all these teams are going to be very good so the suns are currently sitting in six brandon that would mean that they avoid the play-in game but they are only a half game up on the kings because they've played one more game than the kings so that doesn't really count they have one more game against the kings so that'll be huge the Mavericks are also right there, tied with Sacramento, a half game behind Phoenix. So very, very, very close. I guess, how much does the play-in worry you? Not like we get the play-in is scary, but just thinking about what we know about this Suns team, how do you think they would handle that? Yeah, it's just, I don't know. I, I think they're built for it, but at the same time, it's it's like it's one game and anything can happen and potentially two games depending on where, where they would end up but um it, it definitely scares me i think every team should be avoiding it like like the plague like honestly i think the six seed is kind of the the gold mine right now with minnesota sitting there at the the three seed and you know the uncertainty of cat like that's that's a team i think uh there's still gonna be a tough team and cat could be back for that we just don't know what, what percentage he's going to be health wise but uh i think everyone sacramento and dallas are are right there you know the pelicans are a couple losses away from being in danger of sliding down into the play-in as well so it's just it's really uh to me four teams just trying to just play a game in musical chairs and avoid that that dreaded one game and like the teams are all so talented at that stage too it's not like you get in the play-in and it's like a sure thing like uh there's it's, it's going to be a fight and those teams the lakers and warriors despite their struggles this year they still have superstars they still have you know games it could be a ref ball game like you just don't know what's going to happen in those games so i just i want to avoid that as as much as possible it's not about being scared of those teams it's just avoid putting yourself in that situation get the guaranteed series um you know the the five seed would would be nice too but then you have the clippers waiting there so it's that's a tough matchup too so to me it's like you can't get too cute and try to aim for a six seed and then all of a sudden you're, you drop into seven. So just win as many games as you can avoid the plan. Yeah. Uh, Captain obvious here, but to me, it's, it's going to be chaos and I'm, I'm here for it. Yeah. The thing I will say is I believe it's, I don't know if a team has never won. I don't, that can't be true. We've seen upsets in the plan, but overall, more often than not, I think the majority of the upsets we've seen have been eight taking down seven or 10 day, taking down nine. We have rarely, if ever, seen a nine or a 10 team make the playoffs, even in this era. I'm sure I'm forgetting one. Maybe there has been one. I'm not saying never. But if you look at the the history of this, it tends to work out. Maybe you drop down from seven and then now you're eight because you lose the first one or whatever. But or yeah, again, 10 surprises and gets to play in that second game, even though they were on the road and the lower seed. So I tend to just kind of trust that that would continue. But you're right. Whether it's Luka, LeBron and AD, or I guess we should say Luka and Kyrie, because they've been both healthy and playing well for a while now, or Steph and, and that group. It's just a little bit different than like in the East where it's the Hornets or, or the Bulls exactly. or something. And so that's why the, I'm the numbers comparing it to the past that. is because of this year's crop. It feels so different to me in the play. Even last year in the West, right? It was like New yeah. Orleans and the Thunder and Minnesota. Now it's, it's, it's really the, the cream of the crop. So definitely those caveats should be, should be given. Uh, I also don't think it's fun to play against the Kings in in Sacramento, even if that's the team you might pick out of these four options. If you're the Suns, like that that road environment is going to be pretty crazy. So there's really not like an awesome option here, I guess, unless you were to say uh, New Orleans somehow fell. That team doesn't have an awesome home environment. They're not the most trustworthy, even though they've been playing awesome lately. 
I could see that being maybe a, a good one, but that's unlikely. So agreed, you want to avoid it. I just wanted to check in, see where we both were. I would favor the Suns to come out of it. It sounds like you would too, but it would be a disappointment, I think, after even after the, the season they've had, to have this much talent and strong stretches of play throughout the season to end up having to kind of fight for your life. The Suns are better than the teams in the play-in, I think you would have to say. Outside of maybe Dallas, who have made some improvements and now have a healthy Kyrie, I think you would say the Suns are better than the Kings. They're better than the Lakers. They're better than the Warriors. And you don't want to have to be fighting for your life against those teams. But any final thoughts there? No, I think you pretty much cover it. Just avoid the plan. If you, if you get there, make sure you you end it in one game and just solidify your spot because you, it's just it's taxing. If you have to play two games where you're just going all out right before you enter a series, that's another thing. Yes, you could build some chemistry, continuity, whatever in in high pressure environments that could carry over with positive momentum in, into that next series. But at the same time, that also leads to more injury risk, more minutes. Uh, just avoid it. Let's just let's just get the you know five or six seed and and. Secure the, that seven-game series, please. Thank you. 100%. That will wrap us up. Check out Brandon's writing over at Bright Side of the Sun. I will have a watch back for you from one of these Spurs games over at the Locked on Suns Insider feed. You can sign up there at joinsubtext.com slash Locked on Suns or click the link in the show description below on YouTube or your audio platform of choice. Back tomorrow with another episode recapping Spurs Suns Part 2. Enjoy the Monday, and I will catch you guys later on. <laughs>